to do that. <laughs> Again, uh, it's the second time. Welcome everybody who's here and everybody who may be watching later uh, to the unofficial the Gorilla Philosophy Club here at CSUS. Uh, my name is William Wyatt. I'm the uh, strictly nominal unofficial president. Um, and I also uh, want to give a quick shout out to our other sort of de facto officer who has done basically all of the work uh, for Philosophy Club up to this point in the semester, Daniel Schultz. Thank you to Daniel uh, for arranging not only this meeting, but several more throughout the semester uh, coming up. And, well, you're, uh, you're quite welcome, William. Um, welcome, everyone. Sorry, my computer just died there. I'm on my phone now. Um, but yeah, welcome. Stingers up, everybody. That is okay. Your audio is coming through just fine. Um, yeah. So uh, today we have a, a presentation uh, by Professor of Ethics at, uh, here at Sac State, uh, Professor uh, Garrett Miriam. Uh, the topic of which, as, I, as I'm reading here, is, uh, yeah, math was uh, never the language of science, a reply to uh, Philip Goff. I have not heard uh, Philip Goff's argument, but this is, as I understand, sort of a, a presentation on science uh, as will be, as will be uh, uh, relevant to ethics and, and philosophy more generally. So uh, thank you to Professor Miriam. And if you are ready, we can proceed. Yeah, no, I'm ready. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I appreciate you paying attention. I know that you guys do a lot of philosophy during your classroom hours. So to sign up for extra stuff shows that you're really my kind of people. And that's just awesome. So I really appreciate you being here. I really appreciate you showing an interest in the subject matter and in the philosophy club. When I was an undergrad, I was a member of the philosophy club and I enjoyed it very, very much. So I'm glad to know that Sac State has, uh, has enough people to represent on that front. So uh, a, a few quick comments before I get into it. Um, those of you who have me as a teacher know that I like to do rather text dense slides and that's because I make the slides available for my students as their own notes. Um, this, I, I try to do the exact opposite. I try to have as little text as possible in this and it's mostly graphics. Um, I'm gonna be, uh, I have my, my, my paper, which I'm gonna mostly read over here on the side, uh, but I'll, I'll try to keep it as, uh, as flexible and lively as possible. Um, and uh, I, I wanna say that uh, in, in, as a setup, again, I, I've, I've not gone into this assuming anyone knows who Philip Goff is or what his argument is. I will try to sort of summarize that charitably and honestly as possible. And I wanna say in advance, I'm going to be pretty critical of Goff's ideas. Uh, so I want to try to sing his praises a little bit first before I uh, uh, criticize him. Um, so you should not take anything that I'm about to say here as a suggestion that uh, Goff's work is like inherently bad or that you shouldn't read it. Uh, quite the opposite. I actually think he's a very good philosopher, has very good ideas and his material is worth reading. It just so happens that he's completely wrong about a number of things. Um, and, and I mean everything I'm about to say here in the constructive philosophical spirit, even though I am going to be going pretty hard on his jugular here. Um, so uh, with that sort of preface in mind, uh, I want to start by, 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 by talking about a story um, that will try to hopefully contextualize everything that uh, I'm, I'm going to say going forward. Uh, so in the, uh, the start, story starts in the early 1990s, and it's about a patient who's only known by the initials DS. Uh, and uh, DS was given an experimental treatment for pain in his arm, and it had to be experimental because traditional methods of pain control weren't working because DS's arm wasn't there. Uh, his arm had been amputated uh, as a result of a motorcycle accident dec decades earlier. This is not DS, by the way. This is just a representative picture of a person who's lost his arm. Um, and so uh, DS was experiencing what's known as phantom limb syndrome or phantom pain. Um, the, the arm that was missing uh, had considerable pain in it and nothing that traditional treatments do, do, did could alleviate that. Now, it's worth noting again that phantom limb syndrome had, has been recognized as far back as the American Civil War uh, in the, the uh, medical literature. So this is, this is a well-known condition. It was initially treated with considerable skepticism, but people knew it was a real thing. The person, you know, DS wasn't just crazy, but just no one had any idea how to actually treat this pain. Now, luckily for DS, his doctor was the pioneering neuroscientist V.S. Ramachandran, who came up with a absolutely brilliant but simple solution. What Ramachandran did is he took an open cardboard box and put a mirror inside of it, dividing it into two chambers. 
and then he cut holes in it. So here's an example of what, of what it looks like from one angle. Um, if you can't quite make it out from that, here's another picture, which will hopefully give you a better sense of what we're looking at here. So it's called the mirror box. Um, and the, the holes are arranged in such a way that you put one, you put your hands in the box, or in DS's case, just one hand in the box. And the way the mirror is set up is it creates the illusion that he has two hands. Uh, Ramachandran instructed DS to close his eyes and imagine he was conducting an orchestra. And when the crescendo of the song hit, DS was told to open his eyes. And what he saw were his hands swaying back and forth to the music and his missing left fingers unfurling for the first time in over 10 years. And the cramps that had been plaguing his phantom hand abated, his wrist loosened up, and the experience of relief just washed over him. And his exact words were, my God, my arm is plugged in again. And this was the first in a series of successful treatments of phantom limb syndrome using Ramachandran's mirror box. Uh, it, this just sparked a revolution in the treatment of phantom limb pain. Uh, it's commonly used now in combination with a bunch of other theory, uh, uh, other, other therapies to treat amputees, stroke victims, uh, and patients with a condition called complex regional pain syndrome. Uh, but what I want to stress here is that this innovation on Ramachandran's part wasn't dumb luck. It wasn't just random guessing. It wasn't just, hey, let's give this a try. Ramachandran was able to come up with this again, really simple idea in execution, but incredibly complicated in conception uh, because he had an incredibly detailed grasp of neurological mechanisms that drive our body's subjective perceptions. Drawing on previous work from scientists like Wilder Penfield, Ramachandran and his team were able to uh, study the intricate relationship between uh, the motor cortex and the somatosensory map in the parietal lobe, and was able to figure out how all this stuff would fit together to allow him to come up with this innovative therapy. So combined with his incredibly creative imagination, a deep concern for human suffering, and years of experience in neurology, Ramachandran took an educated guess, and thousands of patients since then have owed him an incredible debt of gratitude. So in short, what I want to say is Ramachandran was able to cure DS and patients like him because he was a very good scientist. Now, I am not sure what Philip Goff would make of this case, uh, but according to his book, Galileo's Error, Foundations for a New Science of Consciousness, and here's his portrait shot here, um, one thing which I think I have to conclude is that he would say that Ramachandran's mirror box innovation, whatever it was, it wasn't science. Science, according to Goff, as it exists today, is a purely mathematical enterprise, and it has been ever since Galileo Galilei codified it as such in the 17th century. As Goff understands it, and I'm quoting him directly here, one of Galileo's most significant contributions to the scientific revolution was his radical declaration in 1623 that mathematics is to be the language of science. Importantly for uh, our purposes here, what, what this means is that subjective qualities like proprioception, the capacity uh, to, to recognize how your body relates to itself, um, psychological trauma, pain, all these subjective qualities cannot be translated into quantitative language, can't be translated into math, and ergo, nothing scientific can be said about them. Excluding anything that cannot be quantified, according to Goff, has been what has empowered science's incredible success over the last 400 years, because it, it, it can focus on the measurable and the, and the manipulatable, but it's also been responsible for the failure of neuroscience to illuminate the inherent subjective nature of consciousness. So if math is the language of science, then whatever tools Ramachandran was using to uh, cure the phantom pain of DS's missing arm, it could not have been scientific. So uh, as I said, I'm going to, to knock this book around a little bit, or at least parts of it. Uh, but I do want to say a little bit more about uh, its genuine merits. So, so whatever faults Galileo's error may have as a book, uh, a lack of ambition is not among them. Uh, as the book's subtitle suggests, Goff is attempting to both motivate the need for and lay the foundations of a new approach to science that corrects the titular error, that corrects Galileo's error. And this new approach uh, will take subjective experiences very seriously and place it at the heart of our conceptual understanding of the universe. And because according to Goff, consciousness is the most immediate, most indubitable aspect of reality, uh, or at least our reality as subjective beings, it's even more basic than physical matter, according to Goff. Consciousness 
should be the primary element in this new science. On Goff's view, consciousness is not something that is to be explained in terms of material causes and properties. That gets things backwards. Rather, consciousness is the term in which material causes and properties are themselves to be explained. Trying to account for consciousness in terms of physical material processes of the brain gets it backwards. Material processes, all material processes are better understood as manifestations of consciousness. Now, this is not to say that on Goff's reading, physical matter is an illusion. Goff is not an idealist like Bishop George Barclay. He believes in physical matter. He believes physical matter is real. But rather, he thinks that matter, even though it's real, is best understood as a form of consciousness. Matter is not the most primitive, the most basic thing. Consciousness is the most basic thing. So whereas the materialist thinks that our physical bodies are just complex congregations of matter, Goff argues that all things in nature are better understood as assemblages of primitive forms of consciousness. And Goff makes, takes pains to sort of disabuse this idea. That he's, he's not saying that atoms or socks or spoons have feelings. They don't have moods or opinions. They don't see or perceive things. Their, their, their level of consciousness is much, much lower than that. Uh, his point rather just is that in the same way that we think of all material things as being composed of matter, we should think of all material things as being composed of basic rudimentary forms of consciousness. Complex phenomena like physical matter is only possible because they are primitive forms of consciousness that are arranged in just the right way. And the more complex these assemblages get, once you get up to animals and then of course human beings, the more complex the consciousness gets. So the name for this position is called panpsychism. Uh, and is that you can sort of tell by the suggestion, what it's saying is that consciousness pervades the universe. Everything in the world is fundamentally under, best understood as a kind of consciousness. And it's not unprecedented. Goff is far and away from the first person to propose this view. It has a very long pedigree. And in his book, Goff only partially sort of glosses over the long history of it. Um, and perhaps the simplest way to understand what it's saying is to think about sort of the idea of uh, there being sort of a scale of consciousness. So in, I think, what's probably the, the common sense view, human beings are clearly conscious. Mammals are also conscious, but maybe a little bit less so than humans. Birds further down, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. And you know the, the scale of consciousness sort of tapers off somewhere between like maybe fish and flatworms or something like that. And most people would you know scoff at the idea that trees or fungi or single, single cellular organisms have any degree of consciousness at all. And what panpsychism says is just that's, that's a closed-minded thing. Just as people like Rene Descartes used to think that animals had no consciousness at all, we should open ourselves to the idea that trees and fungi and single cellular organisms and even the, the fundamental particles themselves actually do have consciousness, just a very, very minor degree of it. Uh, and consciousness in its complex forms arise just because these basic forms are assembling into more and more complex structures, allowing for and creating the, uh, the prospect of consciousness to be, uh, to be realized. Um, so uh, Goff is, is keen to note, and I think he's right, that panpsychism has been something, having something of a renaissance in recent years. A lot of people have been very interested in it. Philosophers, psychologists, some neuroscientists even have taken an interest in the topic. Uh, but his book, Galileo's Air, is the first book length topic for a modern audience that has explored this in detail. Um, and he's deliberately speaking to a general audience. This, this is not a book written by a philosopher for philosophers. This is written for a non-technical audience. Um, and it's the book is incredibly ambitious um, and it's, it's really, really captivating. Uh, and I think it's understandable, I think, why people are attracted to this. Um, who doesn't want to be at the forefront, the new scientific paradigm that's hopefully going to illuminate one of the deepest mysteries of our time, the nature of consciousness itself? We can unveil these deeper secrets of reality and understand things. And you know, if, if, if this is about to be where the science of consciousness is going to go, if he's going to create a new science of consciousness and other people like him are going to get on board, uh, that's really attractive and that's appealing. That's the kind of thing that a lot of people uh, want to get on board with. It's exactly the thing that attracted some people to Galileo's ideas is that they were revolutionary and they challenged the dominant thinking, the dominant sort of Aristotelian view of the universe, which had held sway for so long. 
And Galileo comes on board and upturns the apple cart. And that's an exciting time in history to be around and to think about and to imagine. And I also want to praise Goff for saying that in spite of his ambition, he resists the temptation to cast himself as a new Galileo. Uh, Goff is actually very humble. He's circumspect and intellectually cautious throughout the book. Um, there's no sort of villainous new inquisition of neuroscientists that are dastardly trying to suppress the truth of panpsychism or something like that. Um, he manages to present really complicated scientific ideas and abstruse philosophical thought experiments in a way that's very, very accessible. And I think a lot of philosophers could learn a lot about communicating with the general audience uh, by studying his writing. Um, and it's probably because of that that uh, it's gotten a lot of attention. I mean, his book is definitely a bestseller, at least for philosophy books. Um, and the, the author, Philip Pullman, who wrote the His Dark Materials trilogy, The Golden Compass and the, those ones, uh, which is both made into a movie about a decade ago, as well as an HBO series now, um, Philip Pullman uh, read Goff's book and praised it to the stars. He like couldn't recommend it to enough people. Um, it's not common for philosophers to attract the attention of popular literary authors. Um, so that's just sort of a really interesting phenomenon. Now, unfortunately, again, I've been trying, uh, that's, that's about the limit of my praise right there. Um, in spite of this ambition and the, the rhetoric all being very appealing. The argument that he presents in Galileo's era is actually very, very far from convincing. Um, and it, its shortcomings span the gamut from historical to scientific, from methodological to philosophical. But in short, what I'm gonna say in, in the same way that Ramachandran's mirror box in the beginning illustrated, science is not and has never been a purely mathematical endeavor. Um, the idea that, uh, so science has been a mathematical endeavor and therefore it can't make sense of consciousness because consciousness, consciousness can't be expressed in mathematics is a nice, well-condensed argument. Uh, but unfortunately it hinges on the premise that science only speaks in math. And as I hope to prove here, that's just not true. It wasn't true for Galileo. It wasn't true for his contemporaries or the, the, the great scientists that came after him. And it's not true today. Um, subjective experiences, have always been a part of the DNA of scientific methodology from the very beginning. And so there's no need for a new science of consciousness in order to find room for subjective experiences. Subjective experiences have been a part of the scientific process from the beginning. And to see how that works, we gotta take a, a, a tour back in time to, to Goff's central character in his book, Galileo Galilei. Uh, his argument begins with Galileo and I want to give you a sense of how Goff reads Galileo, how he interprets them, and why Goff thinks that Galileo believed that math was the language of science. Um, now, Goff is certainly right that Galileo was a transformative figure both in science and in the philosophy of science. Uh, and the way Galileo sees him is that he transformed not only our view of the relationship of, of the nature of the solar system, but also how human beings should investigate the solar system, how we should investigate nature itself. The success of Galilean methodology, according to Goff, um, is that it derives from the fact that anything that cannot be quantified is excluded. Uh, according to Goff, previous philosophers had not considered such a method uh, because they took it, the world to be full of sensory qualities, things like colors, smells, tastes, and sounds, and math is incapable of characterizing colors, smells, tastes, and sound, all these subjective properties. Quoting Goff directly here, how could an equation ever explain to someone what it's like to see red or to taste paprika? How could an abstract mathematical description convey the sweet smell of flowers? Um, those of you who are familiar with the, uh, the, the Mary thought experiment, Mary the, the, Mary the colorblind a neuroscientist thought experiment, uh, uh, that's, he's clearly alluding to that uh, here and he talks about that thought experiment in the book. Now, Galileo's solution to this problem, according to Goff, was just to stipulate that such qualities did not exist as part of the material world. Uh, they, they were mental qualities, mental attributes, and the job of science is just to describe the physical world and not the mental world. The material world is, is the business of science. The mental world is the business of philosophy and religion. Science is not in the business of accounting for sensory qualities because they're part of that subjective mental world. Science's purview is limited to the objective mind independent reality. So on this reading of Galileo, according to Goff, paprika isn't really spicy. Flowers don't really smell like anything and objects aren't really colored. 
Such qualities are located in the human mind or the human soul, and they're beyond the reach of the material mathematizable science. So what is Goff's evidence for the claim that Galileo believed this? Um, and to, to try to prove that this is Galileo's belief, Goff quotes a very famous passage from Galileo's 1632 book, The Assayer. Uh, and I wanna read it to you directly. In this passage, uh, Galileo says that science is written in this grand book, I mean the universe, which stands continually open to our gaze, but it cannot be understood unless one first learns to comprehend the language and interpret the characters in which it is written. It is written in the language of mathematics and its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures, without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word of it. Without these, one is wandering around in a dark labyrinth. So this is from Galileo's 1632, the assayer. Uh, now, at face value, this quote undergirds Goff's entire case. Uh, if you look at this quote, and only this quote, then it's perfectly understandable that you would come away thinking that Galileo believed that mathematics was the language of science. He would, you would believe that science is a purely qualitative endeavor. But there's a serious problem with this quotation, and that is that Galileo didn't mean it, or at the very least, he didn't mean it the way Goff takes him to mean it. Um, I, again, I, I feel kind of bad digging in like this, but I think it's strange that in a book titled Galileo's Error, a book that, whose central argument is premised on a very specific interpretation of Galileo's ideas, this single two sentence quote are the only words from Galileo himself. Uh, Galileo wrote hundreds of pages. He weighed in on, his, on the nature of science and how scientific methodology and philosophical uh, and the philosophy of science all over the place. And it's only these two sentences that Goff quotes. His entire historical case that Galileo believed that mathematics was the language of science rests on these two sentences and Goff doesn't understand what these sentences mean. Now, in traditional philosophical terms, what Galileo is saying in this quote is that mathematics is necessary for science to completely understand the universe. He's not saying it is sufficient, nor is he saying that's the exclusive domain of scientific understanding to speak in mathematical terms. For Galileo and most of his successors, as I'm gonna argue here in a second, Mathematics is just one of the many languages that science uses to explain, account for, and communicate its findings. Uh, if you wanna talk about in terms of language, what I would say is science is polyglottic. It speaks many different languages. And a complete account of science in both Galileo's day as well as our, as our own today involves qualities and qualitative and subjective aspects and terminology, not just quantities, not just mathematics. And to see how this is, to see how Goff came to misread Galileo in this way, we actually got to go back and take a closer look at the historical context in which Galileo wrote these words, uh, what was happening in his life and in the world when these words were written and published. So one of the morals of the story here is that if you're going to do philosophy of science, you have to do the history of science, because it's very easy to misunderstand historical figures if you don't take a close look at their broader context. And if your current view of the philosophy of science is informed by what some historical figure thought and you get that wrong, you're gonna make, you're gonna embarrass yourself. And I think Goff here has embarrassed itself. So let's go back. Let's take a quick look. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the year now is 1613. We're going back to 10 years prior to Galileo publishing the assayer. So 10 years before the assayer is published, what's going on? Well, it's in 1613 that Galileo publishes uh, a book which is called uh, Letters on the Sunspots or just sometimes on sunspots. Galileo uh, is not the first person to discover sunspots, but he's the first person to really categorize them and record them and sort of and, and come up with a theory of what they are. And as it turns out, his theory of what sunspots were was wrong, but still it was an important and significant contribution in, 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 in the understanding of the solar system. And for our purposes here today, the most important thing, it's in 1613, that Galileo first endorses the Copernican view of the solar system. That is the heliocentric view of the solar system. This is the idea that the earth rotates around the sun rather than the sun rotating around the earth. Now, 
this was not technically a crime at the time. There's no law against endorsing uh, heliocentrism, but it was at the same time a very, very controversial position and taking a stance on it publicly could invite a charge of heresy. And it did invite a charge of heresy to a number of other astronomers at the time. So two years after this, this letter gets published, uh, the senior theologian at, uh, the, in the Vatican, a guy by the name of Car Cardinal Ro Roberto Bellarmine, I, who is a friend and supporter of Galileo's, wrote him a letter and said in no uncertain terms that Copernicanism should not be publicly endorsed, that Galileo should shut up about Copernicanism. Uh, there were powerful forces within the church uh, that would put him uh, into a, a very, very dangerous position if he were to continue to endorse Copernicanism. Uh, two years after that, uh, the Pope at the time, Pope Paul V, uh, summons Galileo to the Vatican uh, and informs him that the Vatican is going to put uh, any, any books that endorse Copernicanism on their index of prohibited books. Uh, and that will include anything that Galileo writes. So if Galileo wants to stay in the good graces of the church, which he very much did, uh, he, was, he should stop endorsing Copernicanism. Uh, Galileo knew what happened to the Italian astronomer Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake 15 years before for endorsing heterodox astronomy. Galileo took this advice to heart. Um, in fact, Bellarmine even persuaded Galileo to sign a document promising he would not teach Copernicanism. So he's very, very much aware of the dangers of out and out endorsing Copernicanism and the dangers of pissing off the church. And a lot of Galileo's writings after this take on a notably sarcastic style in order to provide cover should it prove necessary. Galileo employs dialogues, not all the time, but frequently. And you know, it allows him to sort of give this kind of plausible deniability. Well, here's one view, here's another view, here's a third view. And so if the Inquisition, Spanish Inquisition ever comes knocking, it's, you know, it just gives him plausible deniability. Oh, you know, these aren't my views, Cardinal Inquisitor. I'm just presenting ideas for the reader to think about and uh, to, to consider. And this kind of duplicitous strategy was not something Galileo was unfamiliar with. Um, a few years prior to this, and Galileo had read Copernicus's book, uh, De, Revo De Revolution Omnibus Oribum Celestium, on the revolution of the heavenly bodies. And he read the introduction to that book, which was written by a friend of Copernicus, because the book was published after Copernicus's death. And one, one of Copernicus's friends specifically tried to say that, look, this uh, all this stuff in this book, it's just a mathematical model. We're not saying it's true. It's just a way of thinking about and making predictions. It's a useful tool for astronomers, but we're not actually claiming that the sun literally goes around the earth. So this friend, a guy by the name of Andreas Ossiander, kind of saved Gal uh, Copernicus's bacon. You know, Copernicus's books probably would have been burnt at the stake without this uh, burnt uh, uh, in mass before people could read it um, if it wasn't for this introduction, which kind of soft peddled the whole thing. Galileo read this book, he read this introduction, and he saw how covering the, the true intent, the true beliefs of Copernicus saved his bacon. There's every reason to think that Galileo would have taken the exact same steps to cover his ass. Um, so while the assayer is not a dialogue, uh, its tone is profoundly sarcastic. Um, it's, uh, it's written as a response to an earlier astronomer, a guy by the name of Horatio Grassi, who was a lecturer in mathematics, and he claimed that three comets in the night sky were damning evidence against Copernicus. Those comets up there, they proved Copernicus was wrong. Um, and Galileo wanted to rebut this. He wanted to push back and say, no, that's not correct. This fits perfectly well with the Copernican model. But again, he's politically savvy. Galileo knows he can't just come out and say this. If he comes out and says this, says this he's going to get in trouble with the church. So as a result, in the assayer, uh, he tries to sort of walk a, you know, to thread a needle, if you will. He tries to carve out a picture of science that is as non-threatening to church power as it possibly can be. And the way he does that is by saying, it's a mere mathematical dispute. You know, the church doesn't need to worry itself about anything I'm writing. I'm just talking about mathematical tools. This is of no interest to the Inquisition. The Inquisition doesn't need to come knocking at my door. I'm just talking about mathematical models. This is nothing the Inquisition needs to get uh, uh, interested in. So the result of this process is the now famous distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Primary qualities are any qualities that can be expressed in purely mathematical terms like height, length, weight, and speed. And secondary qualities are those that could not, like color, flavor, odor. 
Galileo doesn't use the language of primary and secondary equalities. That actually comes from John Locke a few years later, but the basic distinction is Galileo's. Uh, and you see why this is kind of like a peace deal, right? Scientists can worry about the primary colors because you can chop those up in terms of numbers. And then the church and the philosophers can have the secondary colors. That's, the do that's their domain. Um, Galileo is trying to broker a peace here between science and religion in general and his own work and certain factors within the Catholic Church in particular. Now, it's a piece that notoriously does not hold. Eventually, uh, Galileo does get arrested. He gets put under house arrest. So we all know how that, that, process, that story ends up. But the attempt here was for there to be a way of understanding science that wouldn't get him or his contemporaries in trouble with the church. Now, again, I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that Galileo did not endorse mathematics as a scientific tool. He definitely did. He used math and he used it very, very effectively. But science as he practiced it was not limited to mathematics and it could not have been limited to mathematics. Uh, and if the sort of religio historical context in which he was writing isn't enough to convince you, let me just give you a short tour of some of Galileo's scientific career. Uh, again, he definitely used math. He used math a lot. It was a very, very important tool, especially in building his case for Copernicanism. But many of the most important scientific contributions that he made had no mathematical component whatsoever. Uh, most notably, the results of his experiments with the telescope. Now, again, Galileo did not invent the telescope. It existed as a nautical spyglass for many years before him. But once he got his hands on one, he figured out how to improve it, how to make it stronger. And he seems to be the first person who had the good, good sense to point it not just at ships overseas, but at the stars and the heavens. And what he saw, not even what he measured mathematically, just what he saw with his eyes and the telescope were enough to completely transform science. So he discovered craters on the moon. He discovered the phases of Venus. He discovered the rings of Saturn. He discovered the Jovian moons, the moons, you know, the, the largest moons of Jupiter. Um, he discovered the starry composition of the Milky Way. People didn't know that the Milky Way was composed of stars because it just looked like the schmear in the sky. He points this telescope at it. And you can see that schmear is a bunch of individual stars. He realized the Milky Way is made of stars, not by measuring anything, but just by looking at it. And all of this is made without any reference at all to mathematics. It's just, hey, take a look. You can see with your own eyes, the world doesn't work the way you think it does. So the way that Galileo actually practiced science was not purely mathematical. And, and uh, I'm going to save you, uh, because I, I don't want to get too boring and too technical here, a long list of quotes from other writings by Galileo where he doesn't out and out contradict Goff's interpretation, but it shows a lot more nuance and a lot more complexity about the relationship between observation, experience, mathematics, uh, and science. And these other quotes, I have like three or four of them here, um, they all sort of point in the same direction, that namely that subjective experiences, qualitative experiences are very much a part of, science, uh, of the scientific process writ large. Um, so the, uh, the, the point actually is almost tripped over by Goff himself, because Goff actually talks about a brilliant little thought experiment that you may have heard of before. This is the, uh, the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa experiment. Um, now, according to the old Aristotelian idea, uh, if you drop a heavy sphere and a light sphere off the top of a tower, the heavy sphere will fall faster. Um, Aristotle's intuition was if something is heavy, it will fall faster. And if something is lighter, it will not fall faster. Um, now, Galileo, according to legend at least, famously actually ran this experiment and showed that the two spheres hit the ground at the same time. So Aristotle was wrong. But even before this empirical demonstration, Galileo came up with a thought experiment to prove that Aristotle's idea is logically impossible. What Galileo said was, imagine that these two spheres are dropped with a chain linking them. Now, if Aristotle were right, when the chain is slack, the, the, the heavy sphere will fall faster and the light, lighter sphere will fall slower and then, until eventually the chain goes taut. Now, once the chain goes taut, the whole system is heavier than uh, any single part combined. You have two spheres and the chain, that's the whole system. So it should fall faster still than just the heavy sphere all by itself. So it should accelerate. But the chain is also going to be dragged by the slower sphere. So the slower sphere should decelerate the heavy sphere because the chain is being pulled on. So according to Aristotle's idea, the, this system will both be faster and slower at the same time. 
That's logically impossible. Galileo says Aristotelian gravity is logically contradictory. It did not require any mathematical or any empirical work to actually do this. There's a pure thought experiment. A pure thought experiment did had a major contribution in scientific advancement. It proved Aristotle wrong, even before empirical experiment actually proved him wrong. Galileo is using a non-mathematical method here. It's a, a, a method of imagination rather than mathematics. I hope this proves it. Again, I hope this is a pretty thorough case. Galileo simply did not believe that mathematics was the only language of science. That's not the way he practiced science. Now, in Goff's defense, he's not the first person to misread Galileo this way. He, there's a lot of people, philosophers and scientists, who interpreted Galileo as saying what Goff uh, thinks he's saying. Um, Goff himself actually cites a uh, physicist and fellow panpsychist, Sir Arthur Eddington, as claiming that the consequences of the mathematizable approach to science is that, I'm quoting Eddington here, the poetry fades out of the problem and the only serious applications of exact science, by the time the, the serious applications of exact science begins, we are left with only pointer readings. To this, Galileo comments, in 1623, Goff comments, in 1623, Galileo declared that mathematics was the language of science. And in the above quotation uh, of 1928, we find Eddington fully appreciating, perhaps for the first time in the history of modern science, what this amounts to. Now, um, I think this is a really ironic reference because if you've ever heard of Sir Arthur Eddington before, you probably know that he's the guy that provided the first empirical demonstration of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Um, he did this by taking two photographs of stars, one at night and one during a solar eclipse. And as you can sort of see here in this illustration, uh, Ed, uh, uh, Einstein's theory predicted that the mass of the sun would bend the light from the star, making it appear to be in a different position than it was at night. Now, you can't do this during the day because the sun is too bright, so you can't see the stars behind the sun. But during a solar eclipse, the sun is blocked out and you can see the precise location of the stars. Now, famously, this, this picture down here in the corner is, is, an, is a copy of the photograph that Eddington took. You can look at this photograph if you are mathematically illiterate, if you don't even know that two plus two equals four, you can see that the star is being pulled out of place by the math of the sun. This is a scientific demonstration that required an incredible amount of precision instrumentation in order to engineer the experiment. But to demonstrate that the experiment proved Einstein was correct required no mathematics at all. All you had to do was look at the photographs side by side. Th this is where the star is at night when there's no sun dis uh, 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 distorting gravity. And this is where the star is during the solar eclipse when there is a sun there. They don't line up. The star appears to be in a different place. Isaac Newton was wrong. Albert Einstein was correct. This was one of the most powerful demonstrations in, the, in, in 20th century physics, possibly in the history of all science. And it does not require mathematics. And it doesn't stop with Eddington. Um, Galileo's contemporary, uh, a guy by the name of William Harvey, proved that blood circulates, um, which was a revolutionary idea at the time. And it, it did not require any mathematics at all to do. It, 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 all he did was cut a snake in half pinch off the artery and watch blood sh stop shooting out of the vein. That was all it took to prove that the heart circulates blood. Um, a novel idea, scientifically revolutionary, a true idea, a correct idea, no mathematics necessary to demonstrate it. Um, and it doesn't stop there. You, uh, a century after Galileo, uh, Isaac Newton comes along and demonstrates that light, that white light is composed of the standard uh, uh, Roy G. Biv uh, rainbow. Um, white light is all the colors of the rainbow put together. The composition of natural light um, is something that, uh, uh, that Galileo proved using a refracted prism. And as you can see in this picture right here, there's no math involved in this. This is just look at the white light come into the prism, look at the colors come out the other end. The white light is composed of all these different colors. You do not, you can, you can literally be mathematically illiterate and understand Newton's demonstration here. Louis Pasteur demonstrated both the germ theory of disease and the efficacy of the process that bears his name, pasteurization, by using a series of simple experiments that, that you can sort of see right here on this graphic uh, that don't require any mathematics at all. Again, it required mathematics to imagine it, but didn't require any mathematics to do it or to demonstrate it. 
um, you can show that the germ theory of disease is true and that the other competing theories of disease were false, even if you do not understand a lick of mathematics. Charles Darwin, famous book on the origin of species, contains no mathematical equations at all. The only mathematical symbols are basic counting numbers. One of the most revolutionary books in the history of science had no math in it, but according to Philip Goff, I guess that means it's not science because it's not speaking in the language of science. It's not speaking in mathematics. So again, this is just a short tour of the history, but I hope it sort of proves my point that science can be done without, matic, without mathematics. Science can be done with subjective experiences, just looking at things and recording them in a subjective, non-objective, non-mathematical fashion. All these scientists did it this way. They use mathematics as well, to be sure. Mathematics is a tool that scientists use, but it's not a necessary tool. It can be, science can be done even without math. Now, heading towards my closing now, I want to say that this same basic lesson can be applied to the science of consciousness. Um, the, uh, it was a very popular view, even amongst people who are not panpsychists, even amongst people um, who are, are, are materialists across the board, uh, that consciousness is something that re resists scientific explanation. Um, no doubt many of you have heard of David Chalmers' famous hard problem of consciousness. Um, and you know, Goff is piggybacking on a lot of the uh, ideas that Chalmers puts down. Um, and you know, Goff says, I'm quoting Goff again directly here, physical science has a dismal track record of explaining consciousness. Um, and you know, David Chalmers is certainly going to agree with that. Now, what I wanna say here is that Goff, like many other uh, people, philosophers, scientists, and lay people alike, have just been hypnotized by David Chalmers' incredibly incisive rhetoric um, and his, his, his very, very astute observations and arguments. But they're just wrong. It's not the case that science has not made uh, any progress in helping us understand consciousness. Um, I think the, the, the suggestion that you get by reading people like Goff and Chalmers is that neuroscience, in as much as it's made any progress, it, it's made really precise measurements of like neuropeptides and the gray matter volume of the left insular cortex. And it's really helped uh, illuminate things, uh, and again, in a purely mathematical way. But the connection between those measurements and the treatment of inherently subjective conditions like depression or trauma or Alzheimer's or chronic pain or addiction or schizophrenia, these things are not incidental. The, our, our scientific treatments of these conditions are greatly informed by very precise advancements in our scientific understanding of consciousness. There are several journals dedicated to what's called social neuroscience, which takes as part of the science itself, our understanding of such inherently subjective things such as empathy, agency, uh, conscience, prejudice, and group affiliation. These are the bread and butter of social neuroscience. And social neuroscience has transformed our understanding of these disciplines. These are not just inherently subjective areas that science can't make heads or tails of because you can't put mathematical terms in them so they can't be scientific. Social neuroscience is all about the subjective experiences and it is a flourishing aspect of, of neuroscientific work. I want to call out one scientist in particular here, uh, uh, the, the scientist Jak Pancek, whose work in a field which is now called affective neuroscience has completely transformed the way that we think about emotions in human beings and in animals. One of Pongsep's original breakthroughs in this field uh, was his experiments on rats. What he proved is something that was really controversial at the time, but will probably not be controversial to you now. It's that, science, that rats can laugh. Rats laugh at hypersonic frequencies. Human beings cannot hear them laugh. But if you put a very sensitive microphone and pitch shift the sound up in the rat's cage and you tickle them, when you tickle a rat, the rat laughs. If you pull your hand away, it will run back to your hand and expose its belly because it wants more tickles. Um, this is something which we get met with a lot of resistance when, when Pongsep first proposed it, but you know, repeat experiments went on to show that yes, rats are having a subjective experience here. They are laughing, they are enjoying themselves, they're having fun. I wanna quote Pongsep directly here. People don't have a monopoly on emotion. Rather, despair, joy, and love are ancient elemental responses that have helped all sorts of creatures survive and thrive in the natural world. 
That's science right there. The flat, purely mathematical character that exclusively characterizes science, according to Goff, is nowhere to be found in the work of social science, social neuroscience, in uh, effective neuroscience, in the work of Jacques Pongsat. In the 20th century, armchair philosophers were pondering, what is it like to be a bat? At that same time, scientists like Jacques Pongsat were doing the heavy lifting to provide an answer to that question. And it turns out being a bat is a hell of a lot like being a human. Yes, in case you're wondering, bats also laugh when tickled. Bats, rats, human beings, we all enjoy laughing. We all enjoy being tickled. This isn't some mysterious gulf between us and our non-human cousins. We are a lot more alike than a lot of intellectuals and a lot of philosophers have imagined. Now, Goff would probably protest that I'm missing the point. He'd say, well, this is all well and good. I don't deny this science, but none of it gets to the heart of the matter. And that is that in spite of all this improved understanding of neurochemistry and functional neuroanatomy and sensory processing, like I'm quoting Goff directly, none of this has shed any light on how the brain produces consciousness. Science might illuminate the things that happen within consciousness, is the suggestion, such as laughter, pain, and mental illness. But consciousness itself, according to Goff, remains as, as occult a mystery as ever. We don't understand consciousness itself. We just understand the contents of consciousness. But what I want to say in response to that is given the power of neuroscience to provide treatments for and treatments, cures, enhancements, and a better understanding of, subjective, of the subjective aspects of the human condition, I can't help but wonder what would qualify as shedding light on consciousness if all these developments don't. Goff seems to demand that in order for science to actually understand consciousness, it has to put it in a mathematical equation. For a scientific account of consciousness to be successful on Goff's accounts, you have to be able to convey to a reader what it is like to see the color red in some kind of mathematical formula. But what I want to say is, look, if a formula is not necessary for us to give a successful scientific account of the origin of species, why should we demand a formula for a successful scientific account of consciousness? Now, none of this is to say that I think philosophy is going to go away or that science doesn't need philosophy. Um, Goff notes that Galileo lived in a time where the distinction between philosophy and science didn't exist. Science was called natural philosophy at the time. Uh, Galileo did not think of himself and what he was doing as distinct from what it was that Aristotle was doing. It was just a refined version of the same philosophical enterprise. It's only in the 19th century that scholars and then later the general public start treating science as its own autonomous sphere. Now, I think if there's an error to be corrected anywhere here in the history of science, that led to profound confusion about the proper domain of science, I think it's this academic mitosis. It's the splitting off of science from philosophy. I think that's a much better candidate for an error. Scientists from Galileo to Darwin to Pongsep have engaged in philosophical ruminations as part and parcel of their occupation. This wasn't a side gig. They weren't moonlighting as a philosopher. They were doing science and writing philosophy. And many philosophers from Rene Descartes to William James to Daniel Dennett have made profound contributions to the advancement of science. The line between philosophy and science has always been more of an academic fiction. Um, it's an administrative convenience so universities can apportion their budgets and compartmentalize things appropriately. And for that purpose, it's really useful. But once we dismiss the idea that science is somehow a breed apart from philosophy, that it's a radically different endeavor that plays by its own rules, Goff's proposal that science is a purely mathematical endeavor becomes even harder to maintain. And I think the intellectual history that I'm laying down here makes a hell of a lot more sense. So I want to summarize here. Um, Goff's case stands thusly. Contemporary neuroscience, he says, has failed to explain consciousness. And to understand why this is, we have to go back to the roots of modern science and reconsider our basic assumptions and start afresh. One such fresh avenue is panpsychism, which may provide a better set of conceptual tools for understanding consciousness, according to Goff. But the quote unquote roots of modern science that Goff would have us go back to is a grand total of two sentences from one book written by a man who was under tremendous pressure to hide his sincere views from scrutiny. That same man wrote other passages in other books that are discordant with Goff's reading of the roots of modern science. And science as actually practiced by that man did not adhere to the model that Goff attributes to him. Subsequent science as actually practiced by many of the most 
estimable figures in the history of science does not fit the mold Goff claims in this universal form of all science. And I claim that neuroscience has in point of fact made considerable success in its advancing of the understanding of consciousness through works of people like Yak Pong Sep and V.S. Ramachandran. And because it has made this progress, uh, science is simply not limited by the constraints that Goff imagines it to be. And therefore we don't need a new science to better understand consciousness. Thank you all very much. Now, I'm glad to see that there's been work, been chat going on in the chat, but I haven't wanted to pause to, to read it. So I hope it hasn't been anything uh, terribly pressing, but I, uh, um, uh, I would love to hear anything that came up in the chat or any other ideas that, the, that you guys have questions or reactions to, to any of this material. Uh, yeah, uh, first, and, and, there, and there is uh, just the one question so far, but we'll, get, we'll probably have more uh, going forward. I just wanna say um, thank you for that. Uh, Professor Miriam, you are probably my favorite uh, presenter of philosophy, bar none. Like, Aww. you happen to be at CSUS, not like a YouTuber or something like that, but you. Might I am be a YouTuber, actually. Editor. I have YouTube videos. Oh yeah. Wait, like, okay, never mind. Uh, <laughs> I'll share you my channel. I'll share you my channel later. Cool. I'll put uh, it in the chat. I'll put it in the and chat. And it's precisely because, like, th there is a a certain um, passion that comes across. Uh, when, when you do philosophy that I think is easily lost, especially when I do philosophy, where it's very sort of questioning and, and uh, that kind of thing. Anyway, uh, so yeah, the, the, the question that we had from the chat, uh, and, and she might want to expound upon it as well, but it's uh, 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 from uh, Krista Wood, who asks, can we, I'm, I'm just synthesizing here, but can we expound upon what uh, Goff might mean by mathematics? Because there's various sort of, um, and, and, and furthermore, like it's it's a, a capacity as a language to describe things because uh, there is the possibility, of course, that that like mathematics uh, is just like a way one way of expressing logic, and the logic is what we're really appealing to, or maybe it's maybe he's really talking about, and and maybe we really mean to say that uh, like science is only only doable uh, with mathematics as in one plus one equals two and uh, and so on and so forth like that can we yeah. can we expand expand on like what math means on Goff's worldview here yeah no that's a very good question carissa um so well, i'll start actually by talking about what galileo understood math to mean because at the time that galileo was writing the dominant mathematical method was the geometric method um uh, it was math was not done using algebraic notation as we understand it. Um, it was instead done using geometric shapes, and uh, uh, it, it's an interesting complex method which is not as efficient as using the algebra algebraic notation. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it, there's the reason why he talked about how the the the, the language of it are, is, is you know, triangles and spheres and squares and stuff like that because that's how math was done back in the day. Um, uh, not too long after Galileo uh, algebraic notation came into uh, to, to popular sway. So I think what Goff is going to mean by mathematics is basically, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it in, in the sense of a professional discipline. It's anything that a mathematician is going to be able to execute. Uh, so that, that's going to be zeros and ones. It's going to be geometry. It's going to be calculus. It's going to be imaginary numbers. Um, it's going to be any kind of formal system of logical. It may, it may even include uh, 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 formal logic as it's taught in philosophy departments, right? Um, uh, that can that can arguably be subsumed under uh, the, the work of mathematics. Uh, so any kind of formalized system uh, that captures relationships between quantities uh, 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 and values, uh, I think is probably what Goff would say mathematics is. And it's crucially distinct from, uh, uh, again, in, uh, subjective work. Again, that's, again, that's the secondary qualities. You know, you, 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 can, you can put a, mathematical equation to a wavelength of light, but you can't put a mathematical equation to the redness of, of, of light. Um, does that answer your question, Carissa? I guess so. I don't know. I, from when I hear like the term of math being applied to, I guess, the psychological processing of 
you know, just our conscious experience, say like the color red, certain, I, like I think about like ones and zeros, like a robot, kind of like how you said at the beginning of the presentation, say like every neuron is either firing on or off. It's either a one or a zero. Um, so when it comes to, so I was thinking like, yeah, I guess it is kind of like math. It's a bit like simplistic. I, I didn't know like if he meant like, oh, we're going to crunch some numbers and we're going to process all of reality with, um, you know, whatever. But I just hearing the term math, I thought about like the ones and zeros and everything kind of is like that um, when it comes to experiencing reality. Uh, you know, with we have our sen like our five senses and even more than that, actually. Um, I don't know. I, the thing about philosophy is that I don't, I personally don't see philosophies as something that is necessarily wrong or right. Like they're just frameworks. Mm -hmm. They're just, here's how I'm going to understand something. And someone might interpret that in a different way, how people interpret reality and how we experience anything, you know, is just a different framework instead of necessarily like, oh, it's not. No, you're wrong. You're right, or whatever. Right. Um, so, what, so one way in which this idea is sometimes expressed is by saying thinking of of theories as as, as models rather than statements. So it's this is it, a model can't be true or false. It can only be accurate or inaccurate, useful or not useful for a certain problem and stuff like that. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of people who share that attitude, Carissa. Um, but to 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 the earlier point, I mean, there's a couple of really good points there. Um, so yeah, will we will will we ever be able to make a digital model of the human brain, of consciousness, etc.? Um, will we be able to create an artificial intelligence system using a computer that, that you know copies the brain or something like that? It was fascinating questions. Um, and I think that Goff is kind of agnostic about that. I mean, I think he admits that it might be possible, but uh, we don't know for sure just yet. But the key thing is that, and again, he kind of borrows a page from Frank Jackson here. Uh, and he says that even if you had a perfect map of the brain, um, if you were just looking at that map of the brain, that digital map of seeing where the neurons are on and off and so forth, and you can look at a brain, if this is what a brain looks like when it's seeing the color red, that mathematical map, will not tell you what it is like to see the color red. The only way you can understand seeing the color red is by- Well, can human beings even describe the experience of the color red? How do you, how do you explain any feeling to someone who can't experience that? Yeah, and that's that's dead on. And, and, and Galileo is gonna say, yeah, you can't do that. You can't put it in any language. You can't put it in natural language like English. You can't put it in mathematical language. It's the a type way... of knowledge that transcends like any words. Yes, any any kind of language at all, mathematical or natural. Um, the only way to, to understand it, the only way to know it is to experience it firsthand, subjectively. Um, so if someone who is congenitally blind from birth, you can never explain to them what it is like to see red. Um, and that's, again, that's an argument that Frank Jackson makes, um, and Goff is taking a page from him. So all the math in the world, all the poetry in the world will not be able to capture the taste, the, the spicy taste of paprika, the smell of flowers, or the, what it's like to see the color red. Those are the only things that can happen immediately through subjective experience. But then again, what does it even mean to experience oh, well, something? A... Because individuals experience something completely different. Like the other day I was having a conversation with a friend and we were drinking some tea and I love jasmine tea. Like I just love it. And she hates it. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. Like, is uh, she tasting it differently? Like what, like are our taste buds different, you know? But is that individuality like something that applies to literally every sensation? Right, that's great. Uh, have you heard of what's called the problem of the inverted spectrum before? No. Uh, what it says is like, uh, how do you know, like you, you've seen a, a, color, a color negative of a photograph before, right? Mm -hmm. What? How would I know if our my subjective experience of colors isn't just an inverted uh, version of yours. Yeah, you so, wouldn't be able to tell. Exactly, you know, we'd both point to the same color. I'd say, that's red. You'd say, yes, that's red. But inside my head, I have a sensation that is radically different than the subjective sensation that you have. Um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that Goff is talking about, right? Is if it is, you know, all the science in the world is never going to be able to solve that problem because no measurement of what's going on in my brain and your brain will ever be able to tell us whether or not the subjective experience that I'm having 
is identical to the one that you're having, or in your example, the, the flavor of the tea. Um, so for him, that's, you know, that's the hard problem or an aspect of the hard problem of consciousness right there. Mm-hmm. Can I add to this? Um, there is a, a distinction that's made by some, some authors uh, in, that I've read now in philosophy of mind, li- literally this semester, uh, between what is termed the implementation and the function. Um, and I, I want to introduce like right off the bat, this is not going to be a perfect uh, uh, representation of either that idea or, or like how it applies to things because that, that idea, the, the implementation function distinction is not um, perfect. It, it sort of layers on itself uh, in a way that, that makes it hard to understand. But basically uh, when you have a, a, a sensation of red, we can imagine that the, there, there is a, a purely physical dimension to it that is the implementation. There is the, um, there, the, the, the various neurons and the sort of very describable electrochemical things going on there. Um, there is uh, the, the wavelength of the light. There's the properties uh, inside and about the, um, the, 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 the rods and cones in your eyes and so on and so forth, all the way down. Um, it is all sort of reducible to the ultimately like energy arranged in a logical structure of the universe. That's kind of the 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 bare, the synthetic physics I'm going I'm working with here. Um, there is, however, a, a separate functional aspect to it that is sort of the subjective experience of color. When you combine all of this physical stuff together, you get an emergent property that is an experience of red. Same with the jasmine tea. Um, and, and the interesting thing about like the, the, the function implementation distinction is that it can be like everything can be broken down into functions and implementations of everything else. Like uh, the, the, the same self same uh, neurons can be broken down uh, into relations between uh, the sort of the, the atoms that make up, I don't know, the cell membrane and the atoms that make up the, the, uh, the material in the ax, uh, the, uh, I think it's called the axon, that sort of insulating bit on the axon rather. Um, and then there's the, the electricity, it's different stuff. There is, and that all functions to be a neuron. So the, this implementation function distinction is an interesting one to be able to make. And it can sort of, it can help us like put terms, uh, rather it can help us put uh, subjective experiences in particular terms that kind of rehouses the sort of the distinction between primary and secondary qualities in a way that layers in a way that I think science can can more easily understand. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I, yeah. I'm not sure if you come across this in your in your mind class or elsewhere, but uh, are you familiar with the idea of the integrated information theory of consciousness? I no, not yet. And so it's referred to as IIT in short, but it, it, it tries to build off of basically everything that you were just suggesting that uh, consciousness can be understood as uh, any system which is capable of integrating information. Uh, and the human brain is the most sophisticated, complicated form of uh, integrated information that we know of. Um, but brains of other animals can do it. But you know, according to the people who advance this view, even more basic systems, even including non-biological systems, can integrate very, very limited amounts of information. Um, and so... Uh, uh, the, you can follow everything you're saying again about, about this idea of, kind of, of implementation down past the neuronal level um, and past the single cellular organism level and you know, say that there's nothing special about neurons per se. What's The only thing that makes them special is that there's so many of them integrated so comple- with such complexity with all these trillions of synapses and so forth. That just allows them to integrate a metric shit ton of information, which is why we are not just conscious, but exceptionally conscious. So the panpsychists love this idea. They want to build off of it and use it, leverage it as their theory of consciousness. It, on that, on that idea, like um, if, if uh, consciousness is the expression, is the um, uh, integration of information, and, and consciousness exists p- proportional to the capacity of a system to integrate information then the panpsychists seem to have something here. Like if it's, even if it's not scientifically useful, it's a, it's, it's a, a, it's a compelling model uh, Mm -hmm. by which to, to explain consciousness, basically just in terms of complexity. If a system is complicated, then 
uh, it might be conscious, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to, get, to be clear, my, my, the argument that I've made here is not a complete takedown of everything in Goff's book, nor is it a decisive refutation of panpsychism. Uh, I'm critiquing just one argument in the book, it's the historical argument, um, uh, and how that traces up to the, the, the modern day. Um, it's entirely possible that everything I've said is correct, but panpsychism might still be true. Um, it might survive on the basis of other arguments like the integrated information theory, which I didn't even address. And quite frankly, I'm probably not qualified to, to give any kind of uh, 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 thoughtful refutation of or criticism of because it's ridiculously complicated. Uh, I've tried to take a look at it and I can't pretend I understand it. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the, the panpsychists have more legs to stand on than the ones that, that I just knocked out, even if I did successfully knock it out. Um, but still, I think that even if the argument, even if the position holds, bad arguments should be knocked down. And I, I want to knock down this yeah. bad argument. Yeah. Lupe, I'm glad you have your son in your picture there. You've talked about him before. It's nice to actually be able to, to see the two of you together. It's an adorable picture. Thank you. Um, I actually do have a question. I don't know if anyone else is up next. Please go for it. Chop at the bit. Go for it. Okay, cool. Um, so right now in modern philosophy, we're actually going over, well, obviously, um, we're going over empiricism, empiricists and rationalists. And right now we're actually touching on Hume and he's talking about matter of facts. So like what I'm trying to understand the concept of it is like basically most of our conception or like ideas that we come to be like, like our perceptions mainly, um, I guess, dependent on rationalism and is empiricists like, are those who are um, claiming to be empiricists mainly just grasping the, I guess the general idea of like, I guess what, what we actually know, like the, the agreements we have with, with the world. Like um, for example, um, I can't even think of anything, but I guess like our ideas of color, kind of how like you guys mentioned earlier, um, is that basically like, would that be an empiricist kind of idea or is it mostly like still depending on rationalists? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Um, so Goff does talk about some of this stuff in his book. Um, and what he tries to argue is that uh, because Hume is the great empiricist, many people have tried to enlist him into being a materialist uh, because those two things often go hand in hand. You know, the, 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 the view of epistemology is that we can only know what we experience. And then the metaphysics underneath that is there's only the, all we experience is the physical world. Therefore, if you're an empiricist, then you must be a, a materialist. Um, but he thinks Hume has been misread in this way. He thinks that Hume properly understood cannot actually be an, a, a materialist. Um, because you know, he quite you know, ardently argues that all, all we can get to is the perceptions and we don't actually perceive the physical world in any sort of uh, elemental form. All we have is our, 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 our subjective perceptions of it. Um, and so he doesn't go as far as to say that Hume would be a panpsychist or that empiricists have to be panpsychists. Um, but he does think that there is a natural reading of Hume, which can be read as a way of supporting panpsychism. Um, I don't think he addresses rationalism directly anywhere. Um, I, uh, I, I think it's an interesting question that I, I don't know off the top of my head of how panpsychists in general would think about rationalism, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head that either directly gives support for panpsychism from rationalism or conflicts inherently. So I imagine that one could be a rationalist and a panpsychist uh, or a rationalist and reject panpsychism. Gotcha. I don't, I don't know that I have a great deal to contribute, but I'm going to try. Um, first of all, I second the opinion about the adorable child, like, holy, holy crap, your child is adorable. Um, um, but, but beyond that, like we were, someone mentioned earlier about sort of like the, we can't really know like if my like sensation of red is like your sensation of red and um apologies to Kimberly and Myra they heard me sort of talking about this before but i'm i'm old enough to remember back in 2015 when we were all arguing for like a solid 
chunk of time there about what color this stupid dress was. And a whole bunch of people, including myself, legitimately saw this dress as white and gold when it was in fact like black and blue or whatever it was. So I think that only kind of kind of goes show that like like even if you can like if, even if that means sort of something, you know, you can map out the brain like what's well, like when they're seeing red, like like we know already that like there's even just empirically there's just difference in like the way we see color. And I'm uh, sorry, I'm just I'm just still mad that I got it wrong, that I saw the dress wrong. I'm still angry about that. Yeah, no, so I'll share that just in case you're not familiar with it. I, I have brought this up in several of my classes because yeah, it, it's it's quite fascinating. And uh, I'm, I hope it's, the picture there is coming across well, uh, but yeah, uh, there was a heated debate if you, if you weren't paying attention at the time over what color we're actually looking at here. And it actually took a fair bit of fairly deep neuroscience to, and vision science to dig in and figure out exactly why this illusion takes place. Um, you can do, uh, you know, uh, object color analysis with computers to find out what the actual colors are, but that doesn't tell you why so many people see it as, as wrong. So uh, yeah, right now, as I look at it, I'm seeing white and gold, um, but the, yeah, the confirmed colors are black and blue, as it says right here in the Wikipedia entry. So. Those are actually black and blue, but damn, if that doesn't look white and gold to me right now. Um, so yeah, so you can you can take this kind of phenomenon and the scientific work behind it uh, as, if anything, the closest that uh, science is going to get to unpacking something like the problem of the inverted spectrum. Uh, it, it can help illuminate the fact that yes, we do have subjective experiences, but those subjective experiences can sometimes conflict and can sometimes be uh, corrected and corroborated by a better understanding of sub this, our subjective experiences through science. And so that goes back to supporting my position that science actually is helping us understand subjective experience, not just telling us you know, quantifiable phenomena. Okay, that makes sense. Um, the only thing like, I guess I'm confused about, or like, try, I guess trying to understand is what is, under what category would would like um, numbers actually be in? Like, cause, yeah, because that just doesn't make sense to me, at least. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the philosophy of mathematics um, and, and the ontology of math, the ontology of numbers is definitely a complicated field, which I'm not an expert in. Um, but one of the most popular views uh, is, is called Platonism, you know, and, and it obviously dates back to Plato. Um, and what it says is that numbers exist independent of the physical world. Uh, numbers are part of the realm of the forms, so to speak. Um, and even if you were to destroy all matter in the universe, two plus two would still equal four. Um, all, all the mathematical truths of, 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 that we've discovered would still be true, even if there was no physical world that they modeled onto. Um, it's a very popular view amongst rationalists. It's a very popular view amongst uh, mathematicians. Um, and the, the, the major contrasting view is a view called nominalism, which just says that numbers are just names. They're, they're, they're names that we invent uh, in order to better make sense of the world in which we live. Now, we can also use them to talk about relationships between names, and uh, we can do abstract mathematics that doesn't necessarily have anything to say about the empirical world. And that math is all well and good. But ontologically speaking, you're still just talking about logical relationships, which just boil down to giving things names, according to the nominalists. There's other views, but um, uh, what, I what I would say, I think, is, is this, is that if the rationalists have any strong claim to making an ontological position, not just a metaphysical position, mathematics is probably their, their, their best beachhead. Um, there's really good arguments that you can't make sense of, of the success of mathematics without treating them as ontologically distinct. Um, and if if they're if if they if math, if numbers exist independent of the physical world, then it can't be the case that we come to know truths about math through experience. So empiricism can't be correct, and rationalism has to be. Um, that's a brief brief sketch of the relationship between mathematical ontology, rationalism, and empiricism. Okay, that definitely clarifies a lot. Thank you. Uh, I had something and I, I, I momentarily forgotten it. Um, so I'll keep uh, I'll have the floor open for, for another little while. Um,
but I also want to say that uh, uh, it is the time currently, 8.47 p.m. Um, I don't want to keep anybody longer than you are able to stay. Uh, I'm, I'm able to stay longer and I want to, but uh, just in case. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll field any more, any more questions, uh, uh, particularly as I'm trying to recollect mine. Um, uh, any anyone who hasn't spoken up yet, um, if, especially if any of you have thoughts, we would love to hear from you. No pressure, no pressure. You are invited, but not demanded. Um, I actually have a question. Go for it. And it was regarding um, the the levels of consciousness that Professor Miriam was talking about with panpsychism especially when it came to like animals and he had the whole um, scale up to even plants having consciousness. Um, do panpsychists break up these levels in any specific way? And how do they, how do they determine um, the level of consciousness that something has? Yeah, it's a very good question, Kimberly. Um, hang on a sec, let me pull up the... Uh, um the picture so I, we can take a look at what, what it is that uh, we're talking about here. All right, okay, yeah, so here's the picture as I included it in my presentation. Yeah, so um, again, just for a refresher in case you forgot really quickly, um, the old view is that human beings are fully conscious and then animals slightly less so, especially as they become older animals, less sophisticated animals, and somewhere around fish or flatworms, consciousness disappears entirely. Uh, and the panpsychist view is that this scale goes down further than fish, further than plants, uh, fungi, single cell organisms, all the way down to the smallest components of matter, uh, the subatomic particles. Um, and so the question, if I got you, Kimberly, is how do we determine how much consciousness a thing has? Yeah, specifically, like, do they give each level a specific name or um, how do they break it down when it gets below the, like, fish level? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so, uh, again, this, the, the most sophisticated version, this goes back to that integrated information theory that I was mentioning earlier. Um, they have created, uh, you know, models uh, of, of uh, how information can be integrated. And if you think about just like the most sort of like the simplest complex system, any, any system that has at least two parts, um, there's going to be only so many ways in which those two parts can relate to each other. But if you add in a third part, then things can get more complicated. And there's more different ways those three parts can get integrated. And then the more and more parts that you add and the more and more connections and relationships you have between those parts, the more and more complicated and sophisticated things can get. So you get the human brain, we think is the most integrated system uh, uh, that we know of. It's got trillions of synapses, you know, uh, millions and uh, tens, of, tens of billions of neurons. Um, and you can, can compare that with you know, a, a dog's brain or a cat's brain, and they've got a lot, but just not as much as human beings. So the, the, the short answer to your question is how do they determine is well, they look at all the constituent parts and how those parts relate to each other. And the more parts they are and the more complex relationships that there are amongst those parts, uh, the more consciousness it has. Now, the people who are really serious about this, allegedly, they think that they can make a consciousness meter out of this. So there is an ambition that they will be able to take this basic concept and create a machine and then go to people in like minimally conscious states and analyze their brains and determine whether or not they are, you know, their, 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 their brain has lost all integration and hence they're not just like in a, in a, a temporary state of, of, of lack of consciousness, but rather their consciousness has been disintegrated entirely or whether or not they actually are still conscious, but they're just experiencing like what's called locked in syndrome where they're awake on the inside, but their body is just paralyzed entirely. Um, so in principle, if this ever actually works, there's some real world applications for this way of thinking, but at the moment it's all speculation and promissory notes. I have something to add. I'm, I have some like, I don't know if this relates at all to like animism. I could do like a little, I, I'm not completely sure about um, Justin Breen. Oh, bye, Justin. <laughs> um, Thanks for coming out, Justin. It was cool seeing you, man. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. 
Um, I don't know anything like about the consciousness of physical objects other than like maybe we project personalities and sentimentalities onto objects and when they like say I, I have a favorite mug and then I break it and then that makes me sad that's some sort of interaction but I, I don't really know about that when it comes to plants I don't know like I personally feel like they have some sort of like knowledge and awareness I have you ever seen like um like a grapevine growing like on like it has little like limbs that reach out and grab onto things like it knows to grab onto things or like why does it know like how to grow or where to grow or like what to do or like thinking about the evolution of plants um, like the symbiotic relationship between bees and flowers and how like plants basically develop themselves to like be attractive towards bees and it simultaneously benefits the bees like they get to make pollen and honey and nectar and all that stuff but then the reproduction cycle of the plant like functions with that as well mm -hmm. I, like i don't know i just feel like plants do have some form of consciousness um in themselves yeah uh, so there, there is a chapter in in goff's book where he specifically argues and and lays out the scientific evidence for the idea that plants are conscious um which uh, is was an idea which was ridiculed and considered preposterous a few you know a couple decades ago but now actually is getting some real traction from some real scientists and he quotes a lot of those scientists in his book um uh, Sarai, Professor Ayala Lopez, uh, talks about some of this work in at least one of her, I think, I can't remember which of her classes, but she goes into some of these, these readings on plant consciousness in one of her classes. Um, and it's really interesting stuff. Um, it's still certainly not, you know, what we would call sort of scientifically mainstream, uh, but there's definitely some interesting results here um, that, you know, some professionals interpret as suggesting that plants are conscious. Um, They'll, they'll like share signals, for example, like if there's a, a forest fire, you know, uh, I don't know, however many acres away or whatever, plants will spread signals from one uh, tree to another. Um, and then, you know, plants will like react in ways that will make them more likely to survive a for the forest fire if it comes up. Um, now, again, critics will say this doesn't mean they're conscious. It just means that they can react to stimuli. But it's at least the case that some people, some again, some real scientists uh, interpret this as evidence of plant consciousness. Uh, I mean, isn't everything kind of a reaction to stimuli? I mean, like even something as complex as like, like human social behavior, like what we're doing right now, like, oh, yes, we are a bunch of human beings who have decided to come to this online thing because hmm, maybe maybe I'll find some people who have something in common. You know, that's all just like evolutionary, like based sort of you know just <laughs> like right. how is that really any different than like a plant sending signals like yeah. that's what we're doing right and i mean it, on the the traditional view the difference is is that i mean again in, in standard philosophers lingo is that there's no uh, no qualia or no subjective experience there's nothing that it's like to be a tree but there is something that's like to be a human um now How do again, we know <laughs> right exactly we I, don't uh, know what it's like to be like a tree I, I... <laughs> yeah and and maybe there is something that it's like to be a tree right yeah we we, we should be you know, intellectually humble about what we don't know uh you know in descartes day a lot of people thought that there was nothing that it was like to be an animal and now we consider that view to be you know not only wrong but backwards and primitive and closed-minded and so, yeah, maybe 100 years from now or even less than that or maybe more than that, we'll look back and we'll say, wow, uh, these people thought that trees and plants couldn't be conscious. What a what a closed minded view that was. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely possible. I don't have a, a, a magic a crystal ball. I can't look into the future. Um, all I can say is at the moment, uh, again, I, I it seems to me a better explanation is just, you know, sort of an Occam's razor approach here. Um, and you don't need subjective experience in order to account for the behavior of plants and trees. Uh, you do need it for humans. Maybe you need it for bees. I don't know. I don't know enough about bees to know one way or the other, um, but I don't think you need it for trees. So again, that doesn't mean they're not conscious. It just means that behavior alone uh, is not, the, the behavior as we see it now is not enough to prove or even strongly suggest, in my opinion, that they are conscious.
Uh, I have a uh, raised hand in the in the participants window. Uh, Kimberly, please go ahead. Um, going back to uh, this notion of like what it's like to be something, it kind of reminds me of like Thomas Nagel, and it's like he's, what it's like to, what it's like to be a bat, and how like he argues that we will we'll possibly never know what it's like to be a bat, but there's certain like things about this being a batness that um that we could kind of see what it's like to be a bat like maybe we could visualize what it might be like to fly maybe we could visualize what it might like to be a tree in the wind with your leaves you know flowing out and I think there is something about like plant consciousness that I feel like they do in a sense have consciousness because when a plant doesn't um, get enough water it reacts it looks sad you know like the the kind of like send signals like it looks at it droops it like you know it sends signals to us that hey I need water <laughs> you know and then there's this thing like I don't know I feel like plants know it's like how could they know what to do and it kind of reminds me of um uh Leibniz in mm -hmm. a sense and how he talks about um his perfect harmony and how everything kind of uh you know, send signal, these the monads and, you know, right. kind of send signals to each other. But it like, that reminds me of panpsychism because in his world, it's like everything sends signals to each other and everything has some degree. Yeah, okay. it, uh, there's an interesting discussion in, in Goff's book about whether or not Leibniz is a panpsychist. Um, there's some people who want to claim that he is because the monadology, right, uh, uh, can be interpreted that way. Uh, but I don't think Goff takes a strong position one way or the other. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, you're definitely right about Nagel. I had a not too subtle dig against Nagel in there. I, uh, I think that he's wrong to be as skeptical as he is about the idea of we can understand what it's like to be a bat, or for that matter, we can understand other people. I think that we can understand it quite well. And part of the way we do that is through neuroscience. You know, we, we have a pretty good understanding of the, the, the uh, neurological structure of bats. We know, for example, that they're mammals and that they nurse their young and they have the same kind of bonding hormones that uh, uh, human parents have towards their children. We've got a pretty good scientific reason for thinking that bats feel love and they feel love for their children. Now, again, that does, that's not a complete picture of what it's like to be a bat, but, but we know a lot. We know a lot more than, uh, than philosophers often, I think, imagine that we know about other animals. And maybe this lesson will eventually extend on to, to plants. You're certainly not the only person who thinks that plants have feelings. Lots of people have suggested that. Some of them are serious scientists. Um, but you know, it, it is, I think, a minority view. And I think the, the, the standard view is that when we look at the plant and think it's look, it looks sad or something like that, we're, we're projecting onto it. You know, or we're taking our feet emotions and projecting them on uh, to the plant. For my part, what I would say is I, I think there's some pretty straightforward ways in which we could test this kind of thing scientifically. And that is we take a look at how sadness or whatever emotional state it is, it, uh, is composed neurochemically, neuroanatomically in the brain, what parts of our brain light up when we're sad, what chemicals are released. And then we compare that with the brains of mammals, birds, and reptiles, and we see what kind of similarities are there. And if we see similar structures, at least in the ballpark, it doesn't have to be identical, but if at least somewhere in the ballpark, then it's reasonable to speculate that they can feel something similar to what we feel uh, when we feel sad. Plants, on the other hand, have no central nervous system. So if they have any kind of emotions at all, it's a radically different kind of emotion than anything that we're familiar with, because it's for us, it's all about the central nervous system. It's all about our neurochemistry and plants don't have either of those things. Uh, so if they're conscious, it's going to be a radical revolution in science that was gonna get us there, which is part of Goff's point, right? Is that he thinks his, his new science will, will do a better job than our current science. I, I wanna um, maybe, maybe jump on this idea of like uh, uh, panpsychism and, and say that it might, rather than be a way of like, explaining consciousness it might be a way of pairing back what we think consciousness really is the traditional view as we've outlined is that there is something called qualia that there is some yeah, on nagel's point like as well maybe or at least maybe i think it's a natural reading of nagel to say that there is an irreducible um solidly separate thing in the universe called qualia or that we can call whatever consciousness there's a certain uh, irreducibility to subjective experience that defies 
that uh, what I what I outlined earlier as the sort of implementation function distinction. There is uh, this 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 hard delineation between what is conscious and what is not, what is an experience and what is not. The idea of panpsychism, as I'm looking at this model, as I'm thinking about like how uh, it just reduces consciousness to complexity, to on one reading the the uh, uh, um, ability of a system to integrate information, that is to respond to stimulus. Um, so it, it might be rather than, or it might be uh, reasonable to interpret uh, a version of uh, panpsychism as a way of not so much explaining consciousness, but totally recon reconceptualizing it to something that is physically reducible in a way that we can work with. Um, and that to in in on my general sort of worldview is much more palatable like there has to be some uh not that there has to be a physical dimension to stuff but rather that things have to be like logically ordered and understandable um in order in order for them to be to be real in a way that can be philosophically accounted for so if consciousness is like that if it is if it is nothing other than uh it, or rather, maybe if, if consciousness in, in reality is nothing other than the complexity and information integratability of a system, then uh, we can we can see like where somewhere humans fall on the sort of consciousness spectrum uh, because uh, as a function of their complexity, and we can do some interesting things with it as well. Like there is um, there there's there's a fact about the universe, right, that it doesn't fundamentally change anything. Uh, any any of the dynamics under which the sort of atoms and energy involved are being treated between like the surface of my skin and an inch above the surface of my skin. It's there the, the sort of arrangements that account for the differences we see in our sort of pattern perceptions are accidental. They, they represent no change in the sort of dy dynamism that we call the universe. That is, I think, part of, uh, I don't know if he was getting in at it, but like there is a, 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 a reading of, um, who is it? Parmenides, who says basically that change and division are illusions mm -hmm. um, because the universe is the same one big unending, unchanging thing, uh, regardless of, of any uh, incidental rearranging of its bits. Uh, that to, is, is a, an idea that very easily integrates with this, um, at least what, what I'm understanding uh, uh, panpsychism to be, such that we could say that as a system, the system insofar as it can be considered as a system, doesn't need to stop at the individual human body. In fact, the human species can be viewed as a single organism with a single consciousness. Uh, that is obviously radically different. This is not, I don't mean to allude the, to the, the sort of um, pseudoscientific magical uh, 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 propositions that have to what? But where's the fun in avoiding that? You you're kind of directly <laughs> alluding to like the collective unconscious of Carl Jung yes. or whatever. Oh, yes, but um, I think I, I the the sort of idea of like collect, the collective unconsciousness of and and furthermore we can integrate we can talk about ideas like animal magnetism and stuff um, presumes that this like this larger system that is the entire human species and and to the extent to which it is conscious will be conscious in like the same way as an individual human when you you can are you technically speaking you arbitrarily divide an individual human from its environment that's like a distinction that we make it's a pattern we see it's it's not of and in the universe to make that distinction at least i don't think so i don't think so. there's there's like a good reason to say that there is a, a real distinction there but if you do make that division, then you can understand a human as being conscious in a specific way, like being conscious like a human or being conscious like a bat. Um, and, and, and if you were to like expand the, the consideration to two humans, then, then two humans are conscious in a particular way. And that consciousness is, is gonna be different. So I'm, I want to distance this idea uh, of, of like panpsychism um, plus monism basically um, with, uh, from, from those like sort of the, the sort of magical worldviews that are used to sell books. Uh, but I, I just want to chime in here something quick, me, that, like, it, that like if we're going to give credence to sort of pseudoscientific views, I demand not, astrology. Not, 
I demand astrology gets its fair representation. You know, it's funny you mentioned that, Daniel, because I, I have two friends who are very dear to me, um, people I care about very much, who are just dyed in the wool lovers of astrology. And I have to bite my tongue every time I see them share stuff on social media. <laughs> because, I mean, in fairness, I don't know. I, mean, I try to be humble, right? I try to say, look, I don't know a whole lot about it. I've never studied astrology. Maybe I have some misconceptions. Maybe I'm wrong about it, uh, but yeah, my uh, uh, my impression is that it's a sort of stock and trade pseudoscience. Oh, yeah. um, but uh, uh, William, I, I, you said a lot there, and there's a lot of stuff that uh, I, I would like to comment on, but I'll, I'll try to sort of keep it brief. Um, uh, but uh, so, Goff also talks a lot about Daniel Dennett in his book, and. Uh, one of the, the Dennett actually seems to be someone who might actually legitimately take the view that science properly understood is only quantitative uh, and is only uh, mathematical in nature. So he, Dennett might actually accept that premise, um, and that takes him in some really interesting uh, uh, directions. Um, but uh, uh, you can you can try to sort of you know get out of that a uh, out, of, out of Dennett's work an understanding of consciousness that is. Um, uh, a different understanding than, than the common sense view of consciousness. And I'm all in favor of that. I'm all in favor of uh, 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 trying to sort of reconceptualize things that we thought we once understood, right? I mean, the history of the intellectual history is loaded with people thinking that they understand something like heat, for example, only to later discover that our, our model for heat, our, our, uh, what we imagine heat to be, is just mistaken. Um, and it's quite, quite possible that our folk conception of consciousness might be dissolved just like that. And it's going to take some radical new thinking, maybe something panpsychist, maybe something more like, you know, the kind of, as you're suggesting, William, uh, to shake us out of our old way of thinking and, and bring us to our new way of thinking. Um, I have to, again, I don't know if that's going to play out like that, but that's part of the reason why, again, in spite of the fact that I have a lot of criticisms, I actually do recommend Goff's book because even ideas that are wrong can sometimes inspire people to think in new and creative ways. And even if I'm right that panpsychism is wrong, someone might read this book and start thinking and have like a Kantian reaction to, to, to the panpsychist and come up with a radically new different way of thinking about it. So, you know, uh, let a thousand flowers bloom, right? Not to um, hijack this and legitimately make it about astrology, but I have to, um, I have to share this fun tidbit. Someone did, um, a professor, the story here about did, did an experiment where he you know like asked someone you know what their their birth was and everything and you know like what astrology sign people were and everything and then he gave them their horoscope and asked them like hey how accurate would you say it was and of course you know he got a bunch of people saying it's way accurate and then pulled the rug out on them by telling them that they all received the same horoscope regardless of what their date of birth was yeah Penn and Teller did that on their old television show it was it was pretty funny uh, they debunked a lot of stuff on there, if I remember right. That's that's bullshit, right? That's the one. Yep. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's the fun thing about about uh, not just astrology, but a lot of different pseudosciences is they mostly supervene on on sort of psychological manipulation. Cults do the exact same thing, and, and I want to again make it as clear as I can that is not anything remotely is like what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm in, in, in suggesting that there is something that is like to be two people in this, uh, uh, for the same reason that there is something that is like to be one person that there isn't like a qualia to, to this, that consciousness is just complexity. I am not saying anything remotely sellable, you know, <laughs> there's no, you couldn't make a newspaper out of it. Um, but yeah, that's also, it's also true that like, for me, at least for me personally, there is, um, a huge gap here represented by, by the, by what I'm saying, like thinking out loud in this way. So um, yeah, uh, this, this notion of this, this, this concept, I suppose, this very loose uh, concept that, that consciousness is just uh, complexity functional. Um, then yeah, that consciousness is, is speaking to me. It's, it's jiving with my worldview otherwise. Um, and it has some consequences, yeah, uh, but it's not necessarily like, yeah, it's not clear that we could scientifically say that, that, that is, that it is the case. It might just be more, might more, it might be more accurate to say that like, um, we can more, e we can more easily like, uh, uh, I don't know, 
predict whether or not and to what degree a thing will be conscious by its complexity if we have a robust scientific understanding of that rather than trying to synthesize qualia to something. Yeah, I mean, and like Carissa was saying, right, is we, we don't have to just assess things in terms of whether they're true or false. We can assess them in terms of whether or not they're interesting, whether or not they're useful, uh, whether or not they inspire creative ideas in us. Um, so yeah, I mean, panpsychism or any of these other things might uh, might meet those criteria, even if they don't meet the criteria of technically being uh, true by whatever uh, standards of truth that you, you use. Um, but you also note, yeah, one potential other consequence of panpsychism is that there can be uh, macro minds of sorts, combined minds that are constituted by larger integrations of things, whether that be, you know, the collective uh, consciousness of humanity or something like that, uh, or maybe the internet, you know, obviously the internet uh, uh, taken as a whole has a lot of integrated information and it's only getting bigger every day. Um, so you might, uh, you, one potential consequence of panpsychism is that there is a, a, a broader scope of consciousness out there, not just on the smaller end of the scale, but on the upper end of the scale. And, you know, it might give us some tools to better understanding how to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, on, in the way I'm trying to, to integrate panpsychism into my own thinking is, is, is as a very humble thing where just sort of, it, it, it's, it's a, a, uh, I don't know, a model that, that excludes quality, that excludes anything to, uh, irreducible for being irreducible. Um, but that's kind of, that's, that's what Goff is getting at, isn't he? Like, like, uh, that because those sort of subjective experiences are, are irreducible, they should be excluded from consideration just means that nothing that is irreducible can actually exist, or rather it, science has to assume that they don't actually exist to, to make sense of things that do actually exist, definitely. No, I think, that, I think one way, the way I would read Goff is by saying there is something which is irreducible and it's consciousness itself. Uh, you, you, you cannot explain consciousness in terms of something more basic um, but you can explain other concepts, which some people take basic, uh, in terms of consciousness. Um, he, again, he has a reasonably complicated discussion of what he calls uh, uh, um, uh, innate qualities or in in inherent qualities. Oh, I'm forgetting the exact stuff. It's too late in the evening. Um, uh, but you know, he, he tries to show how we can use consciousness as our, our, our groundwork, as our foundational concept for everything else in science. Oh. Skylar, are you still with us? You're the only one who hasn't spoken. <laughs> yeah, I'm still with you. Okay, cool. I just wanted to know if you were, if you were there, if we were just chilling. Yeah, I feel we may, have, we, we may have not exhausted the topic by any means, but I have probably exhausted myself uh, in terms of uh, uh, reconceptualizing things and talking. Um, Same, yeah. I'm, I'm still on campus. I still got to drive home, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sleep in the um, classroom <laughs> real quick william i know myra specifically asked about um the recording for this and where or if it will be made available um do you know or have that figured out so that i can get back to her not about that? yet um and in fact i have a couple a few a few urgent tasks to get to before i go to sleep tonight um, that may prevent me from from setting that up but basically what i'm intending here is that there's going to be a youtube channel that is like the philosophy club archive there's already a google account in our name but i, I can't I, I had some trouble accessing it last time anyway that's going uh that's that's the current plan is to just it's just uh, render the video out um and and post it post it there under under this like date and, uh yeah under this date and topic and, and, and again on that that on that topic i again i posted my own youtube channel in there william if i have recorded lectures and other talks that I've given, uh, some at Sac State, some at elsewhere, uh, as well as uh, like, you know, there's recorded lectures like the ones you see in my online classes, but there's also like lectures where I'm at a podium and, and it's being recorded and such, um, as well as times when I'm just sitting in front of the camera and spouting whatever the hell's off the top of my head. So if, you, if you're at all interested, you can check that out. I have subscribed already. Yeah, me it's been too. a while since I've uploaded a video. I keep meaning to go back and make more, but it ha but I, I keep getting distracted by other things. Well, you've you've got something. You've got twenty k. Yeah, it's <laughs> pretty that, impressive. That's a number. Yeah. 
All right. Um, you know, so, so I mean, I don't know if you guys know like Philosophy Tube and stuff like that, but I think she's got like a million subscribers or close to it at least. So, yeah. you know. uh, I've seen one Philosophy Tube video. I've seen quite a bit of ContraPoint. She also has a lot of, a lot of following. Um, yeah. Wonder if there's any sort of court yet yeah, that you know, never, never. I've just, I just sort of noticed there's a lot of like trans activism and sort of like leaving academic philosophy with them. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because the I mean both of them kind of dropped out of traditional academic philosophy and made their own sort of independent thing online. And you know, there's a big conversation going on right now in in the discipline about uh, the, the the environment about whether or not we are welcoming enough to trans people and there's some outspoken trans critics in philosophy and uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a live wire topic at the moment uh, I gotta say yeah that's interesting honestly that, that would be that's that's interesting like philosophy is just about the last department I would expect <laughs> to be to be a hostile work environment for for uh, trans women but well I mean there there is a, a, a woman um, uh, named Kathleen Stock who just quit her job at, at uh, University of Sussex and she's 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 a woman she's a self-identified feminist she's gay and she is staunchly anti-trans I mean that's, that's, that's probably too harsh she's, uh, she doesn't think like trans people should be executed or anything like that. Uh, um, uh, and th I think she would actually say that they, they deserve rights and they deserve recognition and protection. But what she does say is that they should not be thought of as, you know, trans women should not be thought of as women as, and, and trans men should not be thought of as men. We should re insist on their biological sex being their fundamental uh, uh, category. Um, and she got a lot of flack for that. And eventually, I guess the pressure just got to her and she quit because she was just sick of, of people coming for her. So. Uh, well, I, I now have a whole slew of new things to say, but um, we we are <laughs> we are <laughs> nearly two hours day, into this. Yes. Um, Indeed, I will just say very briefly, you know, in response in response to that there's a saying, "Um, fuck around and find out," and you know, it seems like that's what happened. That's that's one way of interpreting the experience. Yeah, <laughs> it's a couple ways. Um, okay. <laughs> Okay, Sorry. so um, I'm gonna uh, uh, like sort of sign us off um, and 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 end the recording portion, um, and we can stick around if we want to afterwards, but no no obligation. So um, to those who are here, to those who may be watching uh, later, however long later, um, however long YouTube is around, I suppose. Thank you for coming to this uh, meeting of the Philosophy Club. Thank you especially to uh, Daniel Stoltz for sort of arranging not just this, but like several professorial presentations to to come. He's like, this is going to be a fun semester from here. Um, and, and thank you to Professor Miriam for uh, 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 doing that thing, doing that whole, that whole last thing that we just got finished doing. Um, and, and thank you for watching. Uh, I have been William Wyatt. This has been the Philosophy Club and drive safe.